So welcome to Build, a new channel on Seeking Wisdom where we're going deep in how to build products and product teams. I'm Maggie, PM here at Drift, and I'm super excited to be joined by Martin Erickson, a giant in the product community, uh, founder of Mind the Product, the world's- physically and metaphorically. <laughs> uh, the world's largest product management community and conference, founder of Product Tank, also the co-author of the book on product leadership, an executive in residence, a veteran product person, and the list goes on. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, so I just wanted to start really quickly with sort of how you got to where you are. I think a lot of the, the Seeking Wisdom audience are practitioners, and we haven't really made the leap to experts. So how did you first get into product and then make that jump and um, into advising product teams? Yeah. So I started actually building stuff online way back in the 90s. So I was kind of tinkering at home in high school, 94, 95, just as the web was exploding. Uh, and back then I was, I guess, a web designer and a web developer in as mm -hmm. much as I knew how to do HTML and CGI script, which is all web development was back then. Uh, and I was started universities. I went to business, international business administration uh, at a university in Sweden but probably spent more of my time in the computer lab than in my classrooms mm -hmm. and lecture halls, building the first student website, uh, building the first website for the student magazine, like all this kind of stuff. So I actually dropped out after two years uh, and went and kind of started working as a web designer, web developer in Stockholm for a couple of startups. Uh, took on all sorts of titles that were, you know, hybrid things, a website manager and things like that until the end of 1999 when everything kind of went bust, uh, the startup that I was working for included, and I ended up moving to London and working for Monster, the job board, mm -hmm. as a product manager. And suddenly I was like, oh, there's this whole like library of knowledge. Yeah. And, like, did you know that you wanted to be a PM or is that something that sort of No, happened? I just knew that I had kind of developed this idea that I was a good generalist and mm -hmm. that I had a little bit of design skill, I had enough kind of technical skills to work with the developers, but I was never gonna be an art director, I was never gonna be an engineer on its own. Mm -hmm. And then I had enough of that business studies, even though I, I dropped out, that like that combination of those three things was a really good generalist role. And I think it was first when I moved to Monster that I kind of discovered that there was this whole title and kind of skill set around it. And uh, that's where my journey as a product manager started. Mm -hmm. So then how did you go from, you know, your first experience at product in London at Monster to one of the world's experts in products? I think it was just, you know, as with everything I hope, I think will be a theme of what we're going to talk about today mm -hmm. is kind of it's a journey of learning, right? So I started as a practitioner. I was working on the team, uh, rolling Monster out to the rest of Europe. So we were two or three people in the London team. We were, I think we were in four countries when I started and we were 18 countries by the time I left. Mm -hmm. uh, and back then it was much more kind of hands-on. So we were building up local teams. We were helping them figure out what are their local requirements. We had product managers in every team and in a way, totally the wrong way to do it, but in a way we were kind of the filter between them and the engineering team, which was then, back then, actually based here in Boston, um, out in uh, near Framingham. And so we kind of got to be that almost a consultant role of like trying to figure out what are the local markets need, but also how do we sell that into the core organization? How do we find the kind of common themes that we can prioritize for the whole of Europe, things like that. But also did a bunch of uh, growth through acquisitions. So we did a bunch of M&A where I th would come in and help kind of integrate those products into our existing product stack. And in one of those acquisitions, I actually ended up moving back to Sweden because we had acquired a, an applicant tracking system, mm -hmm. a very early kind of software as a service. It wasn't even called software as a service back then. What, what um, year was this? This was uh, 2003, 2004. Uh, so they were called application service providers. Amazing, pre-SaaS. Pre-SaaS. And I uh, kind of took over that whole business unit. So I kind of owned both the P&L and the product development. And that was obviously kind of a big, a big step up for me to not just be a, a hands-on individual contributor, but actually own the whole strategy, own the P&L of it, try to sell that into the rest of the organization, get mm -hmm. all these 14 countries on board with why SaaS might be a good idea instead of just selling job ads. I uh, worked through that for three years and... Um, then moved on to the Financial Times, where I kind of helped them sort out some of their class online classified stuff. And again, just I think every step in that journey was just kind of figuring out how to look at the bigger picture and, and bring together that bigger picture with my generalist kind of skills. And that that's why it felt like a very natural progression for me to move up from kind of a hands-on individual contributor. Mm -hmm. And then the last two product jobs I had were VP of product for startups, right? So first VP of product to Huddle, and then VP of product for Covester, which is also based here in Boston towards the end. And as, you know, the first product person taking over from the founder, building up a team, building up an org, mm -hmm. figuring out how to 
I make product work in that org for that customer, for that market. Um, and those were amazing learning journeys of really going from that individual contributor. And I still to this day say that if you're a founder out there starting a business, you're actually better off hiring a practicing product manager uh, as your first head of product and then giving them the chance to grow into a VP product. Because if they don't, you can always hire a VP later, mm -hmm. but you don't need that seniority from day one. You actually need someone who can combine the hands-on and help you kind of deliver the vision that you already mm -hmm. have in your head. And they're probably a little bit more affordable. Yeah, that helps, yeah. right? Yeah. So you had two jobs, <coughs> VP product. How, like, how did you get from there to this expertise? I think it was, you know, just a lot of luck and a lot of searching. So while I was at Huddle in London in 2010, uh, I was the first VP of product uh, or the first product person at all in the company. And it can be a pretty lonely job when you're in a startup and you're the first product person. All the engineers are ganging up on you. All the designers <laughs> ignore you. The founder just keeps telling you to ship features. And mm -hmm. there's kind of no one to talk to and learn from and share with and bitch to, frankly. Yep. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just meet other product managers and started this meetup called Product Tank. We had 25 people in the back room of a bar in London. Mm -hmm. uh, my boss stumped up some cash for some beers. I got some old friends to do some two, two short talks. Um, and yeah, it was just an amazing time. And I met my two co-founders, Jana and Simon, there, and we kind of just took it on. And I think we would have just been happy there, right, if we managed to get 25, 30 people every right. couple of months talking about product and, like, sharing some of our lessons and being able to, like, offload some of our mm -hmm. pains. Um, but obviously, we weren't the only ones that felt this need, and it's kind of taken on a life of its own now. So that has grown into uh, the world's largest community. As you said, we have uh, meetups in over 150 cities around the world. Mm -hmm. that happen on a regular basis. We just celebrated World Product Day just because we could last week. Um, and we that managed something to have that you just straight up made up yep, hashtag on Twitter, absolutely. went yep. for it. And we actually managed to get 91 uh, meetups happening on the same day all over awesome. the world. And I was lucky enough to be invited to kind of do the introduction for Auckland and Wellington and New Zealand and then watch it go all the way through to finishing in San Francisco and Seattle on the West Coast. So cool. that was an amazing, amazing experience. But I think it's, you know, we were, we've built it up as kind of an open source thing. We help all these communities get started based on what we've learned. And I think we just all share that pain point, right, of mm -hmm. not having enough people to talk to about this and not having enough people to share our experiences with and yeah. learn from and pitch to. Yeah, that's something I know we've talked a lot about within our product team making sure that you have a, even like a local community of people yeah. that you can just get dinner with quarterly yeah. and just Or even through. an internal community, right? Yeah. As you start growing, like uh, as we talk a bit about teams later, I'm guessing, but I think as we structure our teams more and more independently and more and more autonomously, it's so important for everyone in that team to have a community of practice to get back to, even mm -hmm. within your own company. So the product manager should be getting together regularly. The designer should be getting reg together regularly. The engineer should be getting together regularly to talk about their specific challenges and how they can best overcome them. And what they're seeing is other you know, great ideas emerging in other parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, just on that point, I mean, we might as well skip to it. Um, yeah. How do you, tell, tell me a little bit more about this whole autonomous teams thing and how, how you sort of got on this topic. And then I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you maintain autonomy as your company scales and as you add levels, you know, we're at a hyper growth stage. How do we make sure that we maintain that and what should we be looking out for that we may not know about? So I, we were experimenting with this at Huddle back in 2010, trying to figure out like how do we how do we put the decision making as close to the customer as possible is basically where it started from for me. Um, and the more layers you put between the people actually building it and talking to the customers and the decision, the more likely that message is to get garbled. Right? It's mm -hmm. classic kind of game, of telephone. game if nothing else. Right? Yeah. Of like just how how much that message can get garbled. So that's where we started, and we were playing around and we were you know a small startup at the time we only had uh, enough kind of resource for two or three teams and we couldn't have a dedicated team owning one you know one feature one customer area so we had to rotate them around but we, we tried to give them autonomy within a project so we would like prioritize a pain point like all the things that are now kind of coming out as more and more best practice we were trying to experiment with um, so we would prioritize themes and we had this idea of like, okay, we need to fix this area or this customer problem. Mm -hmm. We're going to spend three months on that uh, and then give the team the freedom to figure out what is the best thing that we can do within three months to solve that customer problem and then rotate them out to do something else because, again, we were too small at the time. So you'd set a deadline. 
Yeah. Like you have three months. No Time box what. it, right? Okay. So what is the best thing that we can do in three months? And we always came up with more, you know, you always have more ideas than you're going to be able to do mm-hmm. in any given amount of time. Like even Google with 20,000 engineers or whatever yeah. ridiculous number they have, they can't do everything they have on their roadmap. So you kind of, for us at the time, that was the best approach to do the prioritization piece of like how much time do we want to invest in solving that customer problem right now? Mm, so we generate okay. a bunch of extra ideas. The team would come up with great ideas that end up in an ice box that we then could revisit later. But um, that gave us a way to think about how important is that problem to us? How much time do you want to spend on it before we have to move on to the next big customer problem? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something I, I get a lot is, um, you know, we, we set deadlines pretty aggressively. We ship a new feature every single month. But if we're, we, you know, we prioritize a customer problem and then we say, OK, we have three months to build yep. it. And then there's the pushback is always, well, we can't solve the problem in three months. So, like, how do you frame that response to a team? For me, it's always like there has to be some way to make that better in whatever time frame. They, I mean, and obviously it is a push push and pull, right? So if I was trying to make something really tight and like said, well, you're only getting one sprint, you only get two because we were working in Scrum at the time. So like mm-hmm. if you only had one sprint, two weeks, yeah, okay, this is a bigger idea. We can't do it. Let's have that conversation. But mm-hmm. when we were talking about the bigger themes, we were talking about three month or six month commitments to like, we want to spend this month, this team's time. So we had two or three teams. One of the teams focused three months or six months on a specific customer problem. And it worked really well. I think for us, it was a great way to kind of time box it. Um, prioritize that resource, uh, but also give the team that sense of autonomy that they were part of making the decisions on what happened. So we would do a ton of pre-work in terms of, you know, we kind of did a dual track type approach to it. So we did a bunch of pre-work in terms of going out and doing the customer research and looking at the data, and then we'd bring that all in in front of our users, uh, or sorry, in front of our team uh, before we kicked off one of these big projects. And then in that kind of ideation session, the first couple of days, we let the team come up with all the ideas. And I think mm-hmm. that's when I kind of click that that's the best way to do it because inevitably most of the best ideas were not the ones that we had come up with as a product team, right? They were right. engineers coming up with you know things that got us 80% of the benefit for 20% of the effort mm-hmm. um, because they knew the solution space so much better that when you present to, the, to them what the problem space looks like, they're like, oh, if that's what you're trying to do, mm-hmm. why don't we just do this? And you're like, right. awesome, feature number one, let's put that up on the board, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where it kind of started clicking for me. And then I think I became a real evangelist for this whole idea of autonomous teams when we started doing interviews for the book. So um, when we write it, were writing the book, we knew that we didn't want to make it just the viewpoint of the three of us authors, because who wants to listen to three more white guys? Like we need to, three middle-aged white guys even. So we wanted to be a much more representative of a broader kind of set of people. And we went and interviewed hundreds of product managers, product leaders, and figured out how do you do what you do? Why are mm-hmm. you successful? And we talked to some big companies, small companies. We talked to U.S. startups, European startups. We really tried to kind of have a, a wide uh, purview. And I think the recurring theme, whatever people call it, was this idea around autonomous teams, putting mm-hmm. the decision as close to the customer as possible, you know, customer-centric, mission-driven, all these good things yep. that we kind of talk about in the book. So that's when I really became like, okay, it's not mm-hmm. just me. It's not my crazy idea. Right. Um, everyone's doing some version of this. Let's figure out how we can talk about this more openly and mm-hmm. how to do this the best way. So I 100% agree. I think especially when I, I listen to a podcast or I read an article and I, I read about autonomous teams, it sounds amazing. Um, how how What advice would you give to a team that maybe isn't autonomous or wants to be that way? And how do you make that happen, especially if you're not the director? So that, I think that is one of the hardest things out there, right? So if you're the member of a team and you're frustrated because – you know you're being given bad bad prioritization, basically, mm-hmm. and because you're talking to the customer and you know that the things on your roadmap are not the most important things for your customer. I think the advice that I tend to give, which is easier said than done, is simply to start small. Find, find something that's, whether it's outside the roadmap or it's a small feature on the roadmap, and show that by thinking about it differently, you can actually have a bigger impact. So I think we were talking about this earlier, an idea around uh, maybe if, even if you have a feature that's on the roadmap, it has a deadline, try to step behind the thinking behind that feature. What is it that whoever wrote the thing, whether it's the product manager or one of the founders or someone in the sales team who you know gave you a ticket, mm-hmm. what is it they're actually trying to solve? And then kind of use all the skills that we have in terms of figuring out the problem, figuring out how to, how to best prioritize that to unpick that and go back to find maybe a better solution for that problem that really does take the customer into account and you think is going to be better because you know more about the customer. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we can do those things in almost kind of guerrilla product management style of just like getting shit done and 
showing that it can be done in a better way uh, is the most impactful way to do it because showing not telling is always best mm -hmm. and then the more you can show that you're making those changes and that little by little uh, it's having an impact on the bottom line or the customer experience or the, mm -hmm. the, the stats uh, the more you're going to be given the freedom to to keep working that way yep so I imagine that you're giving advice like this to teams all the time and you've been giving um, you've been visiting with product teams and helping them for however many years that it's been how has your advice changed sort of over the scope of, of that time and is it has it been autonomous teams from day one or like how did you sort of work up to that I think I used to be more flexible on that point. I probably uh -huh. used to be more forgiving and be like, okay, well, you know, if the founder has a good idea, as long as they're, as long as they're doing the validation. Like for for me, the the cornerstone's always been the customer, uh, and whatever framework you use for it, whether it's lean or other things, like it's, as long as you're validating it with the customer, I kind of don't care where the idea came from or who's who's forcing it through. Mm -hmm. But I think more and more, I am setting teams up and especially now as an executive in residence for a VC firm when I'm going out and talking to these smaller startups that are just beginning this journey I'm really really adamant that they're setting themselves up to build an organization in this way mm -hmm. so even if they can't do it from day one because they're still just a founder and two engineers um, that they're starting to think that way that they're starting to talk that way they're starting to use that language they're starting to think about customer validation they're starting to think about how to let the engineers be part of that process how to let the engineers be part of the user research so that as they start growing, that culture is already there. And then mm -hmm. as they start spinning up new teams, that culture is there, that thinking is there, that autonomy and that decision making close to the customer is there. And again, I think, I think I want to make sure that people who don't, who aren't at the first stage startup can, can do this too. You know, how do they, how do you bring that into your culture if you don't already have it? it it's hard, right? That's the hardest thing about all of the things that we do. It's all about people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, we talk a lot about different methodologies and tools and features and things that we can do, but at the end of the day, it's all about people and having, you know, the right, having the right team, having the right attitude, and then changing attitudes and changing culture is one of the hardest things that we do. And that's why it's so hard to do it in a bigger corporation or a, an established company because they're so set in their ways. Mm -hmm. And actually, the, mo the worst part is whether it's a startup or a corporate, they've gotten to that success. Whatever success they've had, they've gotten there doing it that way. Right. So they see it's even harder than to make them change their minds that they need to think about this differently. Right. So really, again, I kind of use my own tools of like, how do you, how do you start small? How do you show, mm -hmm. don't tell, right? So how do you work together with the, engin the engineers almost or the designers, just kind of break out a little guerrilla team mm -hmm. and then show the founders that, hey, we know this is a customer problem. We went and did the research. We talked to the customers. We did this validation. We did a prototype, like whatever it is that you wanted to get done uh, and show that you could move a lever. Mm -hmm. And then that's the thing that starts opening the eyes of the founders of like, oh, wow, and I didn't have to be involved in that. No, but it's still within the vision. It right. still fits within that kind of goal that we all have. Um, but you got a better result, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, so now you can trust your team, right? So like, sounds right. oversimplification, obviously, right, but like, but like quick wins that allow them. you to build up yeah, that trust with your totally. executive team that allows you yeah. the freedom to be more autonomous. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So when you go in and you're meeting a team for the first time, like, what do you do to diagnose you know, what their particular set of issues are and like how can we sort of steal your model to diagnose our own teams? So I don't have like We're a, all about getting the secrets, yeah, so give absolutely. me the secrets. I don't have a black and white like hard model or anything, but there's definitely things that I look for uh, when I look at startups or or teams. Um, for me, the, almost the number one thing I, I try to unpick, and it's the kind of thing that you can't necessarily ask outright because it's obvious what answer you want, so you kind of have to be a little circumspect around it, but it does come down to how often do they talk to their customer. Mm-hmm. And it's surprising how many startups still don't talk to their customers. I mean, you guys are definitely an exception. Uh, there are, you know, I think the most successful ones out there are obviously the exceptions, but there's a lot of startups out there that still fall under the kind of mistaken idea that the founders know everything about that customer. Mm -hmm. They used to be that customer. Mm -hmm. They know the problem they need to solve, and they're going to build the thing for them, right? And I think it's the it's the worst thing that you can do to kind of get stuck in that fallacy of being your own customer. Right. And uh, that's one of the big things that I always look for is like how how are the how badly are they stuck in that way of thinking? Mm -hmm. How little do they talk to their customers? And how much? How often should we talk to customers? As I, this is the call bad answer, <laughs> but as often as possible. Uh, I think it, it is important to figure out the cadence, and I think this is this is the one of the biggest things, one of the biggest challenges I think around product management is that the answer to all the questions is almost always it depends. Right. So I'm a former consultant, so I'm all in on this former. It depends. Yeah. I don't know yeah. answer, but. 
it depends on you know market depends on your product depends on all of these things but i think the the bottom line is as often as possible and then it's kind of a judgment call from there and i think if we're doing software if we're doing SaaS, it should be mm-hmm. at least a weekly basis right you yeah. should be having conversations with customers and getting feedback from customers at least weekly basis mm-hmm. so talking to customers what else do you look for when you try to figure out if a team is sort of good or bad and so like, what's your mental model around this? Yeah, so a lot of it's around, um, you know, unpicking some of the things around how you how you build great autonomous teams. So what what are those building blocks are there? So is there a good vision statement in place or a mission mm-hmm. statement? Um, is that a customer-centric one or is it we're going to be the number one something because that's not a customer-centric mission right. statement. A lot of people get that wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, there's little clues in there like all throughout the way of like are they thinking about the customer first or are they thinking about we're going to build the best possible product um, so that, that alignment piece, the vision piece, um, how much, you know, it, when you're in the room, how much is the founder dominating the conversation versus letting other people in the room speak? Mm-hmm. Um, there's things like that that I think can pretty quickly give you a picture of like, is this a team that's a functional team or a kind of dysfunctional family? And mm-hmm. can you save that or not? Yep. I know I was reading that. I'm, I'm sure we all read those Google articles on how to build a team with psychological safety and all that. How do you, so again, I read an article like that. How do you actually put that into practice? Like, what do you recommend to teams who might be falling into these traps? I think it's, again, it's like the culture change piece, right? It's, it's challenging, but it is kind of a, I treat it very much as a coaching role. So mm-hmm. I'm still learning a lot about how to be the best possible coach. That It's a whole thing in and of itself. You used to be an athlete. I'm yep. sure you had great coaches and you've seen what that can do. Yes. And that's the approach that I try to take. So for me, it's not about, trying to teach them it's not about pointing out when they're wrong it's kind of taking them aside after a meeting where maybe the founder was like stepping all over their team and being like how did you think that meeting went Mm -hmm. what were you trying to get across Mm -hmm. do you think maybe the team saw this and not that and like do those kind of very soft touch coaching things not do it in a confrontational way not do it in front of anyone else Um, and that goes for team members as well right it's not just the founders and really try to unpick that behavior piece. And I think that, you know, that steps into so many other things that we have around biases and, um, you know, diversity challenges that we can have in the office space Mm -hmm. as well. Like, how do you unpick those behaviors? Mm -hmm. Uh, It has to be done very softly. It has to be done kind of outside of the room. It has to be done in a coaching way. Uh, And I think that's where there's more and more people working on coaching around products specifically. uh, And I think that's a really great thing. And I think we need to see more of that. Mm -hmm. So in in that theme of sort of best practices and what we, we do or don't need to be doing and more of. I, I think I, and I know at Drift, we have sort of a deep skepticism for best practices and this idea that they're only going to get you to the norm of the day and they're not going to sort of help you go even further than that. So when you're giving advice to teams, how do you think about best practices and where are they relevant and, and how do you, you know, as a, an advisor, how do you start to bring more innovative practices into the companies you work with? Yeah. So for me, best practices are at a very high level, right? So for me, best the, when I talk about best practices, it's things like being customer-centric, it's being mission-driven, it's having a uh, you know, regular cadence of customer feedback and, and insight. Those are the best practice things for us, and I think for, for me, and I think that's where, that's something we, we should all be doing anyway. Mm-hmm. The, the level below that is kind of when you start talking about methodologies or different ways to do that or different tools you should be using and you know whether it's lean or agile or design sprints or user research or ethnography like whatever those things are that's where i become completely agnostic and i think they're all tools in a toolbox and they're all great tools there's they're all useful in different things mm-hmm. in different scenarios uh and i think what i hope that i can bring to the table because I've been around the block once or twice, is kind of how to apply those tools and when to pick the right tool. Mm -hmm. So when I go into those teams, I tend to be thinking a lot about, okay, are they hitting that very top level best practicing? Like how often are they talking to the customer? How often are they doing that? And ram that point home first. Mm Because if they're not even doing that, I don't care what they're doing after that. But if they're doing those things, then it's like, okay, what are the specific challenges that we need to solve here? What are the best tools for us to use? And I think even those tools are something I see as a great starting point. So mm-hmm. I would often get a team, you know, we did this at Huddle, we went in hard on Agile and Scrum, and we were doing sprints and estimations and all these things. And we kind of went a little bit too far, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we then we started applying those things uh, on the practice itself, right? Of figuring out what is working, what's not working. Uh, okay, let's strip this apart. Let's take this out. We don't need to do that part. And at the end of it, we ended up with our, our own kind of methodology 
And actually, one of the teams went full Kanban, and one team was still kind of doing our version of Scrum, and mm-hmm. it kind of didn't matter at that point. But I think the best practices are great, um, or those toolkits are great, because they give you a level set, they give you a common language, they give you a common starting point mm-hmm. that you can then improve on and figure out, okay, well, that doesn't work for us because our customers aren't working that way, or we're in hardware, so two-week sprints don't make sense, let's make it eight-week sprint, like whatever right. it is that works for you and your team and your market and your customer. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that I also push on in a lot of these organizations is not to get stuck into that dogma of like, but mm-hmm. the book says do this. And it's like, well. Right. Where the process sort of yeah. becomes the point rather yeah. than the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we talk a lot about, you know, results, results, results. Yeah. How do you get, focus on those rather than the process by which you're working and how to prevent the process from becoming the thing that you're shipping. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's hard, right? And especially if you're a first time founder or a small team, and you're looking up to all these other giants and someone's read Scrum and they're like, this is what we have to do. But like, as soon as you get into that mentality of like, oh, we're not doing standups, we're not agile. It's like, well, no, but who cares, right? Are you doing what you need to do for your right. team? Yeah, we still need to know if work is getting done. Yeah. In some are you, are you At the end of the day, are you delivering a customer outcome or not? Right. right. That's, that's all we really care about. Yeah. How you get there shouldn't be the important part. And it should be a fluid thing, right? It's going to mm-hmm. change. It's going to change when you're three developers and a founder to when you're 300 people in mm-hmm. multiple locations, you're inevitably going to have to th- change how you work. Yep. So where where, had, where do you see people, different companies' processes break along that path of growth? So I imagine the process is, you know, I, I know from being a drift for six months, I know the process is not the same as when I started, and it's probably not going to be the same six months from now as well. How do you, like, what are the inflection points for that? So the inflection points are definitely around, uh, you know, they're actually pretty tightly aligned to uh, fundraising rounds as well, right? So mm-hmm. there's there's something around going from kind of a angel and seed funding to going to A funding where you inevitably hire your first kind of professional product people. You hire those first people who are um, not necessarily a bad way, but like they're professionals, they're career oriented, they're more thinking, you know, it's a job for them. It's not a mission mm-hmm. as much for them. They're not taking less risk on. Um, so that's obviously a big inflection point of like, how do you get those people on board? How do you get them excited about the mission? How do you get them believing in it the same way the founding team does? Um, and then as you scale, I think there are, you know, B run, C run kind of makes sense because that those are big inflection points as the team kind of doubles and triples and et cetera in size. So I think those are the inflection points to look out for. But I think the big one for me is definitely around um, delegation mm-hmm. and the founders, especially learning to trust of their team and kind of letting Sorry. go of their baby, right? <coughs> Just holding in my cop. <laughs> All right, founders, okay. letting go of their team. All right. So, yeah, I think the, the one of the biggest things is founders letting go of their baby and trusting their teams, right? And that's the biggest, hardest thing to do as a founder is to kind of realize that the product is no longer the product that you're caring about. The mm-hmm. company is the product that you have to care about. You have to start thinking about culture and hiring and where should the office be and, you know, all of those other big picture things where you're going to raise the money, how are you going to go to market, like yep. how do you get the teams talking to each other, like that's your product. And I think product people, designers, make great founders, make great CEOs because they have those skills of like stepping back from the problem, yep. trying to understand what the problem is, how do we apply the best you know tool sets for this, how do we align everyone, how do we do the communication piece. But they have to let go of the product, right? They have to trust the team uh, or the VP product or wh- however they've scaled up to take on that baby and, and trust that they're going to deliver that vision. Right. So we talked a lot about, you know, founders about process. Um, you know, what are the, when you, when you come into a team, what are the biggest mistakes that you see just over and over again? Like theoretically we are all the same advice is available to all of us, but we're probably all still doing the same things. Like what is that one thing that you're like, why is every team still doing this? I think, well, I don't know if every team, but I, I, it does come back to me about customer communication, right? It's like, the, the biggest thing that I see so many startups doing wrong is simply not talking to their customer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, you know, bang on about this point a lot, but I think it's it's just so fundamental that if, if you, I, and I think most often you see it, uh, like we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. when a founder has kind of been the customer or they've been the person who's, you know, got the brainwave because they were the doctor, so they have a better way to build a doctor tool or whatever it is, um, they so quickly get stuck in on that solution and they focus too much on the solution. Mm-hmm. And I think what we have to do as startups, what we have to do as teams is actually fall in love with the problem. 
and we have to get excited about the problem. We have to get excited about the space and the mission and the vision, and then everything else will flow from that. But if you get stuck in on the solution, you kind of follow that, even if it ends up being the wrong solution, even if it ends up being you know terrible from a unit economics perspective or a go-to-market perspective or whatever it is, but you're so focused in on we build the best widget X that like you can't think any other way, right? So mm-hmm. a lot of my advice tends to be like how do you step back how do you think about the problem how do you actually formulate your mission and vision statements in terms of customer problems how do you get everyone excited about that because then like we'll afford you a lot of different solutions to achieving that i think i'd like to talk a little bit about the book Mm -hmm. so i know i read it um a bunch of people here read it all independently of even knowing that you were going to stop by and thank you yeah you know i'm just looking for secrets i want to know how to do my job better and prove dc wrong that i'm worth hiring um, I, I still, that's why I still do what I do. I'm going to learn how to do this job better. So Yeah. So my favorite quote from it is, um, daily swims in the ocean of ambiguity are a part of the product leader's life. It's just the depth that changes. I love that quote. But what, is it, what does it look like in practice? Like who can we, how can we learn how to do that better? And like what, what, is, what does that really mean? I think it comes down to so many things that are fundamental to building great products and building great businesses, which is to know to understand that you don't have all the answers. And that's Mm -hmm. a really hard thing for most of us to do, right? It's hard as founders, hard as engineers, designers, product managers to really kind of step back from this and go, I don't know what the answer to this is. Um, I don't know the best way to do this. And it comes out in so many different forms, like the biases that we have, the, the approaches that we take, the reason we fall in love with solutions rather than problems. And so that Daily Swim in the Sea of Ambiguity quote was all about recognizing that we have to be comfortable not knowing. We have to be comfortable in a constant state of trying to figure out how to do this better. Not just our job, but also like how to build a product better, how to better better solve that customer problem. And if we at any point get too comfortable going, oh, I know, I know what to do now. I know how this is working. We probably need to move on or do something else or or rethink Mm -hmm. that really strongly because I think that's a a trap. So that's that's the warning point that I know what I'm doing. That's what we should look out for. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, if you at any point feel like you know what you're doing, if you at any at any point feel like I know what this customer needs, you're mm-hmm. like, no, hang on mm-hmm. a minute. Either like step back and rethink that or walk away because you're probably not going to be a great product manager. Right. So let's say we, we, know, we don't know what we're doing. We are totally agnostic to tools. You know, we're falling in love with the problem. We've nailed everything. Like what are the big changes coming in product management? Like what's next? What's the new thing that we should all be paying attention to? So I think the role is still evolving. I think how we're doing stuff is evolving. And I think, that, again, we need to be open to that. And that's why I'm kind of passionately um, methodology agnostic. Because I think it's it's more an approach and a more a, a way of thinking about problems that is important. I think the, the trends that I'm seeing, though, are definitely this kind of move towards autonomy uh, and kind of self-organized teams and co-located teams. And, you know, the best startups are doing it this way. The best bigger companies are doing it this way. Mm-hmm. I think we're seeing more and more proof that, like, these mission-driven, vision-driven companies organized this way are going to be the most successful. I think most recently we saw Pluralsight go public uh, just a few weeks ago at a $3 billion valuation, proving that kind of their mission-driven approach around autonomous teams, and they've done it at relative scale. They have a 1,000 mm-hmm. staff. Um, Nate, my co-author, his team's about 700 people. And they all work in this way. They all work in autonomous teams. They're they're you know co-located. They're doing constant customer discovery, um, and it works, right? So I think that's one of the big things that you know you guys are already all on the leading edge of, but a lot of people are not. I think the other trend that we're seeing is trying to figure out like how product and engineering and user experience actually fit together. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter Merholtz uh, once said at one of my conferences that product at that user experience as a function only exists because product management isn't doing its job and i think that's probably fair yeah okay that before that uh, or you know old school product management was very much a business led function it was all about how mm-hmm. bottom line it was all all about roi and how do we prioritize and i think modern product management is definitely taken on a lot of those UX things and done other things as well. Mm -hmm. Great UX uh, designers are some of the best product people because they have that bigger picture thinking anyway. Um, So it's not about like one is better than the other. I'm never, I never really care about people's titles, but I think as we organize our teams and as we organize our companies, it's important to think about how do those things work together? Is it actually 
one whole product experience team, whatever we want to call it, that actually mm-hmm. works together. Um, who actually sits at that management level? Is it a CPO or a chief design officer or both or a CTO, all three, or is that one team? Like, I think those are the things that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, and again, Pluralsight's one of the best examples, I think, where they actually promoted Nate from chief product officer to chief experience officer, where he owns that whole function. So he mm-hmm. owns experience and product and engineering um, as one function, because at the end of the day, they have to work together. So yeah. even if we are separate teams, we have to treat it as kind of one team. Okay. What's your What's your big prediction for the next, in 10 years, what does the product role look like? I, th- I think if I gave that, if I knew that answer, I would have written another book about it. And uh, I think going back to my earlier point, if uh-huh. I felt like I knew that, I right. should then probably give up and I've fallen into my own trap. So I don't know. I, I hope that we have figured out a lot of these basic things. I hope that a lot more teams are working this way. I hope that uh, we can stop talking about who owns the user and you know what methodology we should be using yep. and yep. actually talk about the important things, our customers and what we're doing uh, and how we're impacting the world and how we can make it a better place and all those very lovely high level goals yep. that I'm sure we would all rather be focusing on. Definitely. So. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, one last question. You have to give, if you had to give our audience three pieces of advice that they can go back to their teams right now and implement. We talked a lot about you know mission, vision, autonomy. We talked about how hard that is to actually implement in your day-to-day, especially if you're not super high up. So if you could just give us three pieces of advice, what, what would they be? So if you're in the team and not one of the leaders? Yeah. I think uh, show, don't tell, and start small. Find some little feature, find some little area of the site that you can improve or product or, or whatever you're working on that you can improve using this way of working to prove why it's valuable. Uh, that would be number one. I think number two is actually pull someone else in, right? So like if you're a product manager, pull an engineer with you the next time you have a conversation with a customer. If you're a designer, pull the product manager with you or the engineer. Whatever it is, mm-hmm. pull someone else along with you. Because they will have their eyes opened by what it is that you're experiencing, and they'll also return the favor. So they'll pull you into one of their conversations. And the more that we can do that, the more you're going to be introducing this cross-functional way of thinking. Um, and then I think the last piece would just be figure out how to how to align yourself with your team and with your customer. And I, I know that's really hard sometimes when you're in the team to get that done. Mm-hmm. But the more that you can think about actually changing your goal or having the conversation about where your OKO should be or, or however that process works in your organization to make sure that the whole teams are aligned around the same thing and that that is actually a customer goal and not a company goal. Yep. Um, I think that those would be my top three things at least. Awesome. Well, thank you, Martin. Really appreciate you coming by. Um, as you know, we on Seeking Wisdom are all about accelerating learning and also the six-star review on Apple Podcasts. It's not quite available yet, but we're trying to get there. So please shout out Martin in the comments. Let us know if you like our new build channel. Leave a six-star review and let me know any other questions you have at maggie at drift.com. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank you.